Hello and welcome to the first Cyclops Road with Creative, fully staffed by Creative Professionals. I'm barely counting myself in there, and I've got paid for some work. But uh, we are here in sponsorship of the Story Bundle that we're all involved with. Um, have everyone introduce themselves. Douglas, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Douglas Smith. Uh, I'm a Toronto writer. Um, I've been writing for about two decades. I started out in short fiction, uh, moving to, to novels. Um, I won Canada's Aurora Award three times, been shortlisted for a bunch of others. Uh, and I'm currently working on uh, finishing up an urban fantasy trilogy. I'm in the last bit of the third book and it's all very exciting. Thank you very much. And Matt, how's it going, Matt? <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Moore. Uh, I'm in Ottawa, Ontario, so two Canucks uh, on, on this call. Uh, I've been uh, writing for about uh, 12, 13 years now. Have um, I stopped counting a number of short stories, poems, columns uh, up here in different places. Um, I won the Aurora Award for Poetry in, uh, in 2018. I've been nominated uh, a couple other times across different categories. And for, for those who don't know, oh, the Aurora is Canada's uh, fan voted award for speculative fiction, uh, as well as activities, so things like uh, events. And uh, working on a novel right now, I have some short stories that are out uh, trying to find good homes. Uh, I write mostly horror and dark science fiction, uh, and occasionally dapple with, uh, with fantasy. All right. And then there's me. Hey there, everybody. I'm your host. I'm the author of The Faith Machine, which came out earlier this year, and Pick Up the Ghost, which came out a long, long time ago. We are going to be getting together to play a game called Microscope. You start with a blank slate and you do a, this an exercise in world building, a communal exercise. And an essential part of this is Edgar's Chronicles, which I'm always going to give a shout out, even though it looks like I spelled the name wrong on the title card. I'll fix that later. Uh, the programmer that, Kai Snowski, uh, is what makes this whole thing possible. Um, what also makes this possible is that we are all part of a digital bundle. Uh, we have our books from our former publisher all for sale right now at a cheap, cheap price. Douglas, would you like to elaborate? Yeah, it's the um, very exclusive dark fantasy and science fiction bundle from the, uh, the excellent Story Bundle. A lot of you may be familiar with Story Bundle. They, uh, they've been around for a number of years. Um, they offer uh, a bundle of books anywhere, 10, 10 to 15 books typically in a bundle. And you can um, pick up the base bundle for a few bucks. And if you want to pay the bonus, you got, in this case, all 11 books. Um, and what makes this exclusive, maybe I should give a bit of the background. This, this bundle came about uh, sort of out of a, a dark uh, event when the, um, the Toronto uh, publisher cheesing small press uh, collapsed in late 2019. Um, and the problem with that is that the, the authors who had their titles and rights held by, by cheesing suddenly had um, uh, all their books orphaned, meaning, you know, uh, buyers could not find the books anywhere. So um, I started this process in, in late 2019, reaching out to the cheesing authors uh, that I knew personally, like you two, and um, a bunch of others, and we sort of spread the web until we got most of the cheesing authors on a, on a discussion about whether they'd like to participate in this bundle. And um, that immediately led to uh, a number of first steps that had to occur, and one was um, the authors had to um, uh, get their rights reverted from cheesing. And I'll say that the publisher, um, certainly to, to my knowledge, cooperated fully in that. Any author who wanted the rights back to their book uh, had them reverted in a fairly quick time period. It was, I think, by January uh, of this year, uh, everyone had their rights back. Some cases, it was a little more complicated because, for example, for me, I already had my rights back and I had my cover rights some authors had to get their cover rights back from the cover artist. In some cases, Cheesine had the cover rights as well. So the main point was we went through a long process and at the end of it, all the authors put up their hand and said, yes, I have my rights back. The next step was because these are ebook bundles, um, 
we we had to go through the process of in some cases educating the authors on how they created ebooks uh, and providing some some help and for the ones who didn't know some of them uh, knew how to do it um, went through that phase there was another couple months where all the authors um, got ebooks produced and then it was a matter of um, just identifying who wanted to be in the bundle, what what specific titles we were going to put in, etc. So anyway, long story short, um, worked with Jason Chen, who owns Story Bundle. Uh, he's been great throughout this whole process. Very patient, because this was essentially nine months from from the start of the discussion to when we actually were able to say, "Hey, folks, go buy this bundle," uh, and uh, the bundle is now available. Uh, it runs only for three weeks, and it's been up for about a week now. So uh, September 9th, the bundle will uh, no longer be available. And Tony, I'm hoping maybe you can some at some point throw up the the link for that bundle. Oh, that the bundle's at the bottom of the video. And I will go. Oh yes. Okay. Great. And uh, and then when I when I upload this to YouTube, it'll be in the doobly doo at the bottom. Um, how about how what were your experiences uh putting together new covers did you did you uh license the old cover from the artist or did you get a new one um i'll go first because it's the short discussion i'd already i'd left my print rights with with cheese scene but a long time ago i got the ebook rights for Camariscope back mm. and at the same time uh, because i love the cover which um, is by eric moore eric i think Matt, you may be able to correct me. I think he pretty well did every cover that that she's in put out. Um, so I, I had purchased the rights to reuse that cover from from Eric a while ago. Um, that was my experience. So it was pretty simple. I didn't have to worry about it. Matt, for me, uh, I mean, I have tremendous respect for for Eric Moore, who's done the cover of. Uh, virtually all the all the books that Cheezing did, with the exception of their um, their best of Imaginariums, uh, a couple of um, reprints that they did, authors got their got their rights back and and uh, had them done through through um, through Cheezing. But uh, uh, I I imagine that the cost it would it would uh, have to to get the the rights back uh, from Eric uh, was probably cost prohibitive. I mean, my book had had been out; it had had its had its run, so I wasn't sure if. Um, uh, was worth the, the financial investment. So for me, it was just purely a financial decision. So I know someone who who kind of dabbles as, as an artist, so I reached out to them and, and they put the cover together for me. I have kind of a complicated relationship with my the, the original cover because it's what changed the book's genre. They It was their first young adult book and they went to Barnes & Noble and said, do you like this for your Barnes & Noble section? They said, no, we don't like that cover for the Barnes & Noble section, give us a new cover. And they're like, we can't afford to commission a new cover, so it's no longer young adult. <laughs> now it's dark fantasy so uh everything i had in mind uh, it's in now because of that it's in libraries in the wrong section uh, so that's why yep. i commissioned a new why well, I, I say commissioned a new one i just found a free uh photograph of a factory and i photoshopped it a bit and i did my own i made a pass at doing my own uh layout but everything i did made it look like this is our community barbecue flyer so I had a friend of mine who's a graphic artist actually add the text to the top of it. I don't know what it is about me and topography, but we don't get along. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a key <laughs> element in covers that most people yeah. don't can't do, including me. Maybe we should say the name of our, our books that are in the bundle of tones. Oh, so sure, yeah, absolutely. Is, uh, mine's Chimeroscope. It's a, it's a collection, uh, which was a finalist for Canada's Sunburst Award. Um, the Aurora's and uh, CBC's Bookies Award for Best Collection. And, and Doug's book definitely deserved all of those uh, awards. I, I read it when it came out and was blown away by it. So it's um, it really is a, just a fabulous collection. I mean, Scream Angel in, in there is just a barn burner of a, of a story. Uh, my collection is called It's Not the End and Other Lies. It's uh, got 21 stories in there. A couple of them are previously unpublished. Uh, uh, most of them did appear in, in other markets uh, previously. Uh, the, the common theme of them, I'd say, is what I call personal apocalypses. And it's the idea that the world is an ending, but yours is. And that can mean your job, your sobriety, your marriage, um, your value system, even your very sense of self might be, might be disappearing. 
And one of the stories in there, one of the original ones, was long listed for Canada's uh, Sunburst Award. And then my contribution cool. is the novel Picking Up the Ghost. Uh, that novel started with me creating a list of tropes I was tired of in fantasy. So like an orphan with a destiny finds a magical doodad with guidance of the, the man in the cave or whatever. It's basically the, the spine of the King Arthur story. And I was like, I'm going to post this in my blog and set the world on fire. And then I realized I would just be another jerk with a list on his blog. So I instead turned that list into the... Um, I inverted each of those tropes, and that became the, the sort of core of that story. Uh, didn't win any awards or anything. Uh, so here's our game board. Probably should have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here's our game board. We have, before the sessions, decided we're going to do Fantastic Toronto during the Magical Drought. Uh, and then our start and ending periods are Everything Was Fine Until Magic Disappeared and on an easy detente forms around the new magical reality. And we are just going to go ahead and dive into the game. Matt, you are player one as far as adding items to the palette. Uh, first thing to clarify for, for uh, watchers is there's a drought of magic. It's not that magic caused the drought. Yes. So, <laughs> the writer needs to clarify. Good, good clarification. The adjectives. I'm going to go ahead and change the title while you talk. Okay, so I can add a period between, right? Or I oh. can add an event. We are doing palette items first. So palette okay. items are... Oh, yes or no. Let, okay. let me clarify right, that right. Uh, for anyone watching. So palette <clears throat> items are... Um, let's see that. Palette items are the items that we want to include or exclude. And the way this goes is we just sort of come up with things, either tropes or character elements or character types that we want to, to include or disinclude. Uh, to say something is an on no list is absolute. So if I say no vampires, there's no adding vampires, which are functionally the same thing. Uh, the include is sort of an optional. It's sort of to, to give a feel. Uh, not everything on the yes list is necessarily going to make it into the story, but it's definitely something that you can easily pull from the the, uh, the list. Is All that right. clear? Yep. Okay. All right. Palette. So I'll go ahead and uh, think of a palette by changing this title. I'm going to change it to Drought of Magic. There we go. And while he's thinking on that, Douglas, what's your gaming experience? Douglas, are you there? Uh oh. Uh oh. oh. All right, I'm going to switch titles and we'll wait for him to come back. <laughs> the Fantastic Toronto During the Drought of Internet. <laughs> and go ahead and feel free to talk, uh, think out loud while you're doing this one. It's just the two of us. Yeah, just want to. I'm, I'm just going to type a shorthand here. Um, this is a this is a just a shorthand for saying uh, it's not that you're born with or without magic, kind of like the Harry Potter BS that. People got it's anybody can learn this like any other skill, but some people are just going to be naturally better than others. Yeah. So magic. So that's, that's my that's magic, my shorthand for it. Magic isn't mutants. Isn't what? Mutants. I don't know that term. Oh, like in the X Men. Oh, mutants. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I heard newtons with it with an <laughs> N. I guess uh, I guess one line got crossed off there. All right, let's carry forward. All right, uh, we had a little technical difficulty. That's why our switching around on the layout is different. Well, we are ready to go. Douglas, your turn to add a palette item. Okay, what did oh, uh, Matt what added? Did I miss? No muggles or mudbloods. So anyone's no capable are... of doing magic. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. All right. Um... Well, Doug's thinking should uh, yeah. Let's make some small talk. Got about something. I mean, you asked you asked Doug before he dropped it about his gaming experience, and I can I can answer that question for for myself. All right. I uh, played D and D as a kid when it first came out. Um, 
had some friends in high school I played it with, but kind of dropped out after that. Uh, had a had a D and D group here in Ottawa that I joined maybe two years ago, but um, had to drop out of that for for reasons I won't go into. with a long story, mm-hmm. but um, I'm really not much of a gamer actually. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I I have a bit of an addictive personality, and so when I get into something, I really really get into something. So uh, my wife had gotten a um, like a CD with a uh, video game on it maybe 15 years ago. That just thought, oh maybe I'll I'll give this a shot, and that was like all I did when I got home from work for hours. So. Yeah. Uh, and anything like that, I try to uh, I try to take with in in moderation because I can just dive right into it, and you don't get any writing done that way. Video game addiction is a problem I deal with too, uh, especially like the sandbox games where it was it will be literally just hundreds of hours wasted, enjoyed but wasted. All right, looks like you're done, Doug. Would you go? That was with? quick. Yeah. Go ahead and read off what your palette item is. Oh, okay. Companion animals or even insects are part of the magical world. All right, excellent. All right. Uh, I'll go ahead and think about mine, and you guys go ahead and talk. So, Matt, what are you you working on these days? I am working on a novel. It is a tentative title called A A Nice Place to Live. And um, the the comp model, the comparison that I'd, I'd use is um, imagine if Leland Gaunt from Stephen King's Needful Things, uh, instead of going to Castle Rock, he went to Derry uh, to try to kill Pennywise the Clown. So that's <laughs> that's that's a good idea in a nutshell. All right, cool. And I added. Is this a standalone? Yeah. Sorry, John. No worries. I added su- no supernatural hunters. So no, I, hey, it's got the title of the show in there. Uh, the whole theme of the show is supernatural and stuff like that. No, no people will make a living hunting down the supernaturals. And we're back to Matt. Okay. And we're going to keep going this way until somebody opts to not add in a pallet item. And then we're going to finish up the loop and then we'll be ready to start adding uh, events and such. Okay. So, Tone, I'll ask you the same question. What, what's your current writing project? I am, I finished up the first draft of the role-playing game based on the Faith Machine, so it's a psychic espionage thing. So, um, fortunately, when I had an agent, she asked me to do two outlines after the book so they could, you know, bill it as standalone novel with serious potential. Uh, so I was able to pull all the characters and settings and stuff like that from those outlines, plus all the notes I have from the setting, which I'm calling espionage, ESP, capitalized espionage. And then just, it took me only like two weeks just to sort of put that all into a document for the role playing game. Since I'm using the fate system for rules, I didn't have too much uh, of the, the math to do. Um, some interesting thing that happens when you put all your world building into a document like that, you, you see gaps. <laughs> <laughs> so. I had a few things that I needed to be that could be filled, which I did. So you know, there's in the the spy world, there's plenty of think tanks, and I was like, oh, I don't have a think tank. I'm gonna have one of those. And my my jargon, I had jargon for the psychic stuff. So like, the psychics are cards, and then the person who manages a card is a position player, and then his boss is a dealer. And then I was like, well, I got to keep going with this metaphor. So then the dealer uh, works for a table, which is then part of a house, which is a nation. And then the, the entire scene of psychic espionage is called the strip. It's something I wouldn't have if I, if I hadn't made the game. Very cool. Is it, sorry, is this like a tabletop game or is it going to be? Um, yeah, you know, tabletop. Video tabletop? Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. And it looks like you've added no cool faction names. Interesting. I just find it can be exhausting when you're trying to track who the. We did that, the other are versus the this and versus the that. So family names are cool, but no cool right. action names. Okay. All right, Is this now me? Yep. This is me. Okay. So Matt, you also write poems. I mean, are they also 
horror themed or science fiction themed? Yeah, um, I don't I don't write a lot of them, but uh, mm -hmm. what happens is I'll have an idea for for a story that I can't quite make work as a story, meaning character and events and and you know sequence that and and also tension. Something that's kind of you know pull the reader in, but it's it's almost like I have a cool idea that it can't quite work. And so sometimes I'll just explore it uh, in verse. Like um, I, I wrote a story, the one that won the Aurora Award, is uh, it's called Heaven is the Hell of No Choices. And the idea is that hell is perfect chaos and heaven is perfect order. And none of those are, are good. And it's just kind of somebody's uh, going through their day experiencing these different things. But as a story, it would just be a sequence of events, but putting it as a poem, uh, I thought it really, really worked because I was able to uh, explore some of the, the imagery that I had in my head uh, and, and get that out in, in verse. So I like that that's another way to explore the different ideas that appear in my head and want to get out without having to put, uh, you know, uh, who's the character, what's the dialogue, what's this, what's this, just boom, done, put it okay. down. All right, it looks like you've added an item. I have. Go ahead and read that off. Magic is learned, not hereditary. In other words, anyone can do magic if they take the time to learn the rules. All right. So we don't have sort of the magic people and the non-magic people. Okay. All right. You guys talk while I think. Doug, do you want to talk about uh, the novels you're working on? Yeah, it's. Um, I'm not at the point where I'm even thinking of marketing them, so I don't have the the, uh, the cool little elevator speech I'm supposed to have. But it's uh, it's urban fantasy it's set in Toronto. It's a trilogy. I'm working on the end of uh, the third book, as I mentioned. Um, what are they about? They're about um, um, this uh, teenager who has um, came back from a. An expedition with his somewhat shady parents who are sort of um, relic hunters. And he comes back from an expedition in South America without any memory of what happened to him. His parents were lost and he um, he has acute agoraphobia, but he, he finds that he's able to walk in people's dreams. Um, so he's, he's sort of confined to his home, um, which is a very nice home. Uh, because he's, his parents were very affluent. Um, we, he can't go out, but uh, when he dreams, he can go anywhere that he wants in anyone's dreams. And it's, um, it's got dream walking, obviously, astral projection. Uh, in the first book, he comes up against a uh, nasty body swapper. Um, uh, there's rune magic, the strange relics I already mentioned that comes up in book two, where he uh, sort of is, it's the MacGuffin of the series, um, this relic that appears. Um, comic books, because he ends up um, uh, basically creating his own comic book series, first for his own amusement, and then uh, kind of takes off uh, about the dream writer, which is what he is really. Um, uh, it's got portals, and it even has uh, information paradox of black holes. Wow. Um, what's at what's at stake is the uh, is the fate of the multiverse. Because hey, what's what's up the stakes? Why not? You yeah, so about it's, it's been it's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun to write. Is this uh, is this your own system, or did you um, uh, did you do research into into different cultures to 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 uh, you know, borrow or, or or outright use their you know their uh, not 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 that I'm accusing you of, of appropriation, but is this is this your own idea? Or are you basing this on on what exists in uh, in our world? No, this is this is totally my own world, uh, my own creation. I mean, you know, I've, I've done some some research on you know theories around dream walking. There's a lot of people who who think um, you know that's possible, um, and on astral projection. Um, but that's about the only research I had to do other than uh, the third book takes place in uh, Peru. Um, and I actually did a, um, a tour in a bike tour in Peru with my oldest son and my, my granddaughter. So that served as, uh, as a research as well. Um, yeah, but um, my first novel, which you see the art, artwork in the background here, and that art is by the most amazing um, uh, Canadian artist, uh, multi-award winner, Jean-Pierre Normand. Um, 
that was, uh, I did so much research on that because it did pull from First Nations um, um, storytelling traditions, etc. And um, I just wanted to make sure that what I was what I was including then uh, was accurate and um, uh, respectful, etc. So I did a lot of research with that, including uh, staying with First Nations um, um, a, a reserve uh, up in the Chapel. Um, so I really wanted something where I could just make stuff up, and I didn't have to do a lot of uh, the research that the first book required. And I set it in Toronto because, again, you know, I live here, so uh, I, I didn't have to research the setting. I guess I'm lucky because Toronto has that kind of vibe that's acceptable for that sort of thing. Like a supernatural San Diego is just like vampires and beach balls. <laughs> what? Um, Tim Power did. Uh, was that San Diego or is that Los Angeles? He does a lot of stuff in Orange County, which is even stranger, but he can get yeah. away because he's Tim Powers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so ghost, I, ghost <laughs> lore. Uh, I added the element, uh, the yes palette item, magic power can be cannibalized from supernatural corpses. Whoa. So that should, that should cause some fights. Cool. All right, Matt, your turn. Douglas, what kind of research... When do you, when do you... It sounds like you, you, you got research, out-researched on your first project and you... Want to sidestep that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was a lot. I mean, I wrote, I read as much as I could about. Um, um, in fact, I, I put a major afterward in my novel because you know I, I was paranoid about uh, cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that two things: I got everything right that I put in, um, and also that you know I was I was treating all the material with respect. Uh, and I have First Nation readers, etc. So, um, yeah, but it, there was that element of paranoia always when I was writing the book. Um, but a, a lot of the research was was major fun because it involved reading ever so many um, uh, traditional uh, stories, Korean and Ojibwe stories. Um, one of the things I found, because again, I was so worried about getting things right, one of the things that worried me was that I'd read one version of of, um, of, a, of a legend like the flood myth uh, then I'd read another version and they were they were different mm -hmm. and I'm going well wait a minute I don't I don't want to get this wrong um, and it took me a while to understand that what I was reading was simply a written form of someone who had heard that story because it's a traditional um, the story telling is an oral tradition and um, what gets written down is simply the, the version that that author heard when, when they were a child or whatever from their, their parents or their grandparents. So it, it makes sense that you will come across different versions of, of the myths. I, uh, for the but first, it, it was scary at first. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the, the first book, speaking of appropriation, I, I, I wanted to be making American fantasy. So to me, my mind, it doesn't get more American than African American, right? They generate most of the culture that we consume. So I just set it in a, in a city that was 94% African American and all the cast members were black and everything. And that, you know, came together just as the own voices and appropriation dialogue started. So I, uh, uh, I stepped out into that battlefield probably at the wrong time. Yeah. Like I've been, I've been very pleased because I've had, as I said, I mentioned I, you know, I met with uh, and stayed at a, at a Ojibwe um, First Nations bread and breakfast actually up in Chaplow, and I met with the chief and her mother and and um, had wow. First Nation readers, and uh, I've been very pleased that you know the reviews that the book gets when they're from First Nations people, they will say, you know, I picked this up and I was kind of worried about it, but then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy with how the author treated the subjects, et cetera. So, so that was good. But yeah, this, this, this one, I don't think I can, you must have words, but I don't think I can be accused of any appropriation on this new trilogy because I'm just making shit up. <laughs> All right, looks like Matt is done. Items can be imbued with magic. Ooh. Excellent. Douglas, your turn. Okay. So, uh, Matt, do you have 
like a an English background, uh, a creative writing background for poetry, or do you just off the cuff? Uh, no, just off the cuff. Um, I was always an average um, English student, mm -hmm. but I I I wrote. Uh, I've been writing stories. I, I say in um in some of my bios, um, depending upon what kind of mood I'm in, which bio is sometimes just straight ahead, sometimes a bit more uh, goofball, but. I'll say I've been writing stories since I could clutch a number two pencil in my hand and carve uh, shapes of letters into uh, lined paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always I've always been writing. Um, uh, my my parents bought a an Apple II Plus, um, which some people may not even know what that means, but a, mm -hmm. an old computer when I was I think I was ten maybe before then, and it had word processing software. So I just started typing out stories. Nice. And so I've been writing uh, my whole life, but in high school, I took a creative writing course um, for a semester and it was poetry, plays and uh, short stories. And so I thought I'll do great in the short fiction. I can probably hack my way through a play, but I'll do terrible in, in the poetry. And it was it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, my my poems came back with A's, A pluses. My my teacher kept encouraging me to to write poetry. Uh, my play was was in the middle, um, but it, it it did get it got performed by my by my high school and it won a regional award. And she didn't like my short stories, but my short stories were all genre, and she she didn't like the genre. <laughs> what she told me, uh, and it's the best piece of writing advice I've ever gotten, was, Matt, I don't see enough of you in your writing, and that stuck with me to the point where I dedicated my my short story collection to her. And unfortunately, she passed away. Um, a couple of years before it came out, so she never knew. But um, with poetry, what what it is is it's like there's there's really no rule. It's just just put it down. So I mean, I there's some po poets um, you know that that I'll read their work and like wow that's amazing. And I'll read something else that they write and it's like I, I I don't get that. So it's all so very very subjective. But uh, no, there's no there's no real background or training. I just I just do what I do. Um, what you mentioned there yeah. about enough of you in there. So I was at a, uh, a mixed media convention. I don't want to name it because I don't want to call anybody out that I am. But so there was um, it was in Vegas. So you had comic book people there. And then there was also a DJ. And for some reason, on the last day, the DJ was on a panel. Uh, and the DJ was terrible. We hated him. We hated all his choices. He was, you know, I don't think a DJ should be on the uh, constantly reminding people to look at him, uh, that kind of DJ. And uh, on that panel, though, he said, he did say that the most important thing you have to offer is you. That's the only thing unique you have to offer. I was like, okay, I hate everything about you except that one quote, dude. You know <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Douglas is done. What you got for us? A uh, scientific method is known in the world as this, as the story opens, but it is ridiculed. Mm -hmm. This changes over the course of the study. So this is more my earlier comment about how how if magic is dying it has to be replaced by something and we can have the, the different factions begin right. to arise excellent all right which leads to that detente thing that you say we're going to end with mm -hmm. all right uh all right my turn you guys go ahead and talk so doug I, uh when when we were talking before you said that you're writing this trilogy uh before, uh, or you're finishing the third book before you you try to shop the first one one around. Uh, do you right. want to talk about like is that um, you didn't want to get burned, or as you were saying, like you, you wanted to make sure that everything got got lined up? So what's been the challenge of uh, keeping one story over three books together, and then the dividing line? Did you find you had to start moving things from book to book? Um, well, first of all, I guess the the advice to finish all three before you you know publish the first one came from um, Charles Delant, um, another Ottawa writer, um, and he had he had written a um, very good YA series. I, I quite enjoyed it called the Wildings series. Um, I can't remember all the titles of it, but it's three books, and it's about kids who suddenly start to become shapeshifters in this small. Um, um, Southern California town, I think. Um, and, and he said he would have given an arm and a leg to be able to go back while he's writing the third book, to be able to go back and make changes to the earlier book, um, you know, for plot ideas that he suddenly came up with or, or just 
you know, to introduce something cool that he couldn't because he was handcuffed by what he'd already written. Because those first two books had already been published. Um, so I took his advice to heart. The downside of that is, like, I've gone a long time without anything besides short fiction being published because basically I'm writing three novels before any of them see the light of day. Um, but it's been fun because I, and it's also been really good advice because I've got, I've got these um, note files where it basically is changes needed to book one, changes needed to book two. As I go through book three, um, going, well, okay, yeah, I set it up that way, but it was kind of stupid or this would be cool or whatever, but I need to go back and, and change something for that, for that setup. Um, so it, it, it was excellent advice, but it's been, I wouldn't say painful because it, it's fun to have this, this huge scope of stories that you can, you can play with and make any changes you want, but it's also, uh, you know, my, my profile in the last few years has been pretty low in terms of published work. Or have you had some short fiction come out? Um, and again, because I've only been doing, you relate to this, Matt, I mean, I'm, I'm only writing the novels, although since the pandemic, I've written three new short stories, so it's kind of weird. Um, so all my short story publications recently have been reprints too, like over the last five years. They've, they've been reprints, um, mostly in anthologies that take, obviously take um, second rights. And um, a lot of podcasts. I've had a lot of stories that have been narrated and um, and published via the podcast form, which is cool. Most of those have been excellent. I don't know if you've had any, anything done as a as a narrated story, but you always kind of as you click on the play button when they say, "Hey, your story's up," you're you're kind of ready to cringe depending <laughs> on how how good the narrator is. Uh, I had one that was horrible. I won't say what the story was. Um, it's one of my favorite stories, uh, so that was kind of disappointing. They tried to do voices, and they just couldn't do voices. So all the characters had these strange voices. Um, but most of the ones I've had have been so uh, so well done. I've been so impressed. I've got one coming out shortly um, with the No Sleep podcast, and you'd like them because it's a horror podcast. So you'd probably have lots of um, uh, good stuff for them. And they emailed me saying, sorry that it's so slow, we're so slow getting the story up, but we're having trouble finding all the right voices. And then they gave me a list of my characters and they said, okay, this person, they're, they're Hungarian, right? And this person, they're Greek and this person. So they try to find the actual voice accents to, uh, to give uh, the full credibility to the character. So I'm, I'm just so impressed with them. They're yeah, a lot of fun to work with. That's an yeah. amazing amount of work. Yeah. Uh, all right, I opted to not add anything. I feel like the palette is pretty, pretty full. So you guys both get one turn to add something, and then we're going to start the next session, start into the next round of play of that. Okay. So Matt, you're up. Yep. I only have one thing, uh, the, the audio book deal that happened with picking up the ghost, and I'm still balancing the rights for that. Uh, trying to get those back. I actually, I really liked the the uh, the guy who did it, but I look at the Audible page, and a lot of people disagree with me on that. Uh, it's tough. I think it's such a personal reader consumption choice. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty forgiving on that. I mean, I even listen to those uh, LibriVox audiobooks, which are all done by volunteers. Oh yeah. So sometimes you'll get the first four chapters by somebody who's really good, and then. Another volunteer comes by to read the next few chapters, and they're not hitting the same notes the same way. Have you ever considered doing it yourself? I don't think I got the right voice or inflection or endurance for any of that. Endurance, yeah. yeah the the upside is that you 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 would get the inflection on a sentence mm -hmm. correctly because you know exactly you know the, what what mm -hmm. you meant by that sentence. You know where to put the. Uh, That's true. Yeah. So. Um, with picking up the ghost, there were some words that I made up, and now I know how they're pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> because of the game? Yeah, because of the uh, audiobook. Oh, okay, okay, all right, I see, yeah. <laughs> all right, looks like Matt finished. Ne no necromancy or ghosts. Dead is dead. All right. And yet we can get magic from the corpses, right? Yes, he's still, okay. there's still fuel. Okay. 
So I'm to me, it's like a ghost is just sort of like a pool of the energy still in the body. There's no interaction with it. Yeah, I would see the the idea that magic is, as we've been talking about, it's some kind of resource, mm -hmm. but your consciousness, you know, is something separate from that. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd almost say, and not to be too rules based, but if an item, you know, if a if a if a if a sword or a candy bar can be imbued with magic, that kind of implies that it is separate from any biological process that keeps us alive. So good, like it. It's funny you're talking about the. Um, I think it was Doug said that when you're reading a story, you know where the inflection goes in the story, and I found that so interesting. I've had a couple of my stories podcast as well, and uh, there was one where the reader put such a different spin. It's told uh, first person, present tense, so it's very, it's very intimate. And the reader put such a very different spin on this character than I had had in my head that uh, I, I really appreciated that, that it's wow, that the story is, is different. Uh, I've got a, a short story um, that's, that's in the collection called um, uh, Touch the Sky, they say, and it's a very, very intimate story. It's, um, uh, it's about, it, thematically, it's, it's I'm processing the death of my mother. Now, the story is absolutely not about that, but just the, the emotional resonance. And so for me, when I read that story and when, I, when I've read it at, at conventions doing a reading, I have a certain way I read it. And a friend of mine uh, here in Ottawa named Marie Bilodeau, who's a, who's a, a fantasy writer, uh, read it uh, at, at, a, at a convention uh, with, 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 with my permission. Like, uh, she said it was mine, but she wanted to read it as, as an example of something. And when she read it, it was so very different the inflection that she gave and very um, um, uh, uh, just her take on, on the story and who this who the narrator is and the way she read it. And it was just beautiful and really moving because it was a very different uh, way, this character, because th th that, that story is also first person present tense. And so who the person she was inhabiting and in, in reading, it was very different than, than my take on it. But it was it was great, you know, as, as, a, as a creator something I, I, I tell writers who are looking for advice is, is one of the things I say is you as the author have the least to say regarding what a story is about. A story, your work, your story doesn't exist until it gets into somebody else's mind and then they can read into it whatever they want. If, there's, if they see things in your story that you didn't even intend to put in there, it's there because they see it and the story exists in their mind. So I really like uh, when somebody is reading a story and, and putting their own viewpoint on it even if you, the author, didn't really see it that way. I think that's really a great thing about, about creativity and storytelling. I've heard some authors get uptight about people not interpreting their work the way they intended. And it's like, why are you expecting more from the process of reading than you can get from just the, the function of communication, right? It's always, the communication always involves two parties and, and, and two interpretations, the initial one and then the received. So you can't, you can't expect that everybody's going to hit on exactly the same notes that you bring out. I mean, it's like totally that's agree. an interesting thing about fiction uh, is, you know, when it, it's it's one of the few mediums and, and, and like painting or sculpture as well. But once it's down on the page, it's it's done unless you go back and change it, put out a second edition. But like music, um, songs are different every time they're performed or stage play is different every time it's performed. Uh, you know, if, like um, I like the band Pearl Jam and a song they did called Yellow Leadbetter, uh, which came out. God, I was in university, so mid '90s. They're still playing it, but the song has evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved and changed, so that the version that they're playing now, you know, it's it's the same basic song, but just the different mm -hmm. feel and, and inflection and even the lyrics uh, have evolved over time. That's one of the beauty of, of music. But fiction kind of just exists on the page. But when somebody's going to read it and put their own interpretation on it, I think that makes the storytelling element alive because we're storytellers. We're just choosing the fixed print form. Mm -hmm. Doug, Doug referenced um, oral storytelling traditions in, in First Nations cultures as another form of storytelling. Yeah, you know, that, yeah that, that and, all right. and, and speaking then, of Doug, it looks like you added an item. Can you read it? I added an item. Where is it? Oh, there place. it is. Um, no wands, crystal balls, or other typical magical equipment. So let's right. ignore those cliches. I am down with that. All right. So that was the palette. Now we have completed the palette. Everybody happy with everything here? Is there anything somebody wants to tweak in light of what we uh, contribute otherwise? No, I like this. Uh, I'm good with this too. All right. 
So now we're going to go to the first pass. Everyone adds either a period or event in any order, except for before or after your end and finish. Uh, again, Matt, is your first turn. So a period being a period of history and then an event being inside that period of history. So I, I usually like to use the, the analogy of a period would be a war and then an event would be a battle. Okay. The periods are defining the, the flow of the story, right? More than anything else, yeah. Yeah, okay. So like in comic books, death of Superman would be a period and then the uh, when the four replacement Superman showed up, that would be an event inside that. I'm not sure if my metaphor hit, but... Yeah, no. <laughs> I was a DC comic kid growing up, but haven't read this stuff in a long time. But the, are the periods essentially, you know, if I... Would it be like Act 1, Act 2, Act 3? Is that sort of the equivalent of how you're trying to structure the flow uh, of the story? More like a historical record. Okay. So this game, it can be played as a game by itself. It can be done as a world building thing like we're doing here uh, for an audience, but it's also sometimes used to create the backstory for a role playing game. So a bunch of gamers okay. will, will, uh, will, they have a rough idea of what they want to play. Say they want to play a, a fantasy game, um, mm. but they all want to contribute to what came before. And then rather than buying a world off the shelf, they have something like this. All right, looks like Matt's done. I just realized I made a grammatical error. The subject and verb don't align. Okay, do you want to fix it? Can Is I? Bug you? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead and read that. A transportation accident when magic based vehicles Ooh. fail. I'm assuming that in, in this world, because we talked about the scientific method, is, is known but ridiculed that most. Um, Technologies are magic based. Oh, okay, cool. That that is wild, Matt. That's um, exactly what I was envisioning. <laughs> Transportation accidents, or, or the yeah, wild. no, a bus, a bus of school children uh, flying to school crashed. That now, is weird. Well, now I have nothing though, so. <laughs> <laughs> but later on, you you know you can play a scene inside that. That'd be in the children's school bus. True enough. So that's cool. Great minds think alike. So whose turn is it now? It's yours. So uh, just to clarify here, Tone, do I add another event? Could I put a scene in front of that? You can't add a scene. You can okay. add a period or an event. Um, and then you can only period. add the period in between the two periods that we have now. OK. So I can add another event. Mm -hmm. And is it sequential? Yeah, so uh, chronologically, things go from left to right. Okay, then but if I want to add an event before Matt's, I click. There's a, oh, I you, see. If you hover over, yeah. uh, there'll be a plus event right there. Got it. So Matt, how are you uh, promoting your work in the time of COVID? Uh, all I've got out right now is the uh, is the collection. So um, I've, I'm putting out some stuff on social media. I've asked some friends to help, uh, help promote it. Uh, something I'm going to be working on today is um, uh, dusting off my my website. I, I um, kind of shut my website down uh, for a bit when I really wasn't doing a lot of writing. Uh, but I'm going to dust it off and probably put up some posts and maybe uh, talk a bit about a couple of the stories in in my short short story collection. Uh, just you know what what inspired them, what what I hope people take away from them. Uh, just to hopefully try to generate uh, some interest and a little bit of behind the scenes um, of, uh, of what's happening. Yeah, it seems like these times everybody has to lean into social media, which is something I've yet to be successful at as far as. <laughs> creating a, a, an audience. I've, I even got wrapped up into that hashtag writers lift thing. Are you familiar with that? No. So in hashtag writers community, they, they've combined it with hashtag writers lift, which is sort of like, Hey, I'm at 
109, well, 1,900 uh, followers. I need another 100 followers to get to 2,000. So it's basically a bunch of writers friending each other just to inflate their numbers. And uh, I bought into it for a little while, and I was like, what, why are we even doing this? Like, we're, we're not even reading each other's posts. We're certainly not going to be buying each other's books. Yeah. Uh, and I, I eventually just sort of, it was, it was seeing people with these numbers from the high, I was starting to feel like the number had some sort of value of its own. And then I was like, I'm just stressing out over the fact that I cannot do this successfully. So I'm just not even going to try anymore. Yeah, there's a song, um, I'm Googling it right now, but I can't, can't find it. It's called, I think the name of the song is just New York. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's kind of a, about a, guy who leaves the farm with a guitar and goes to New York and seeks, seeks his fortune. But there's a line in there that I love. It says something like, uh, we dream of being, dis it's a group, a group dreams of being discovered by someone other than each other. <laughs> and so, yeah, that idea of I'm famous in my group of friends. Yeah. All right. We got a new event. Care to read it? Magic fails at a hospital or at hospital and medical facilities throughout the city. All right. Ooh, upping the stakes. I like it. Death, more death. <laughs> All right, you guys go ahead and talk. I've got mine already in mind. Yeah, what, what you were talking about with, with Tone, about um, so many authors just seem to market to themselves. I mean, I, I don't think I'm great at social media marketing or whatever, but I do focus on trying to find my readers and, and connecting with them. Doug, for, um, for people who, who don't know you, like I, I, I I've known you for a very long time, but um, you literally wrote the book on selling and reselling your, your short fiction. So uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so I guess the impetus of that was I'd been, I'd written short fiction and been selling it at, at to pro markets for close to 20 years when I started that book. Um, and like, like you, you know, we've both been to the conventions and you sit on the, the panels about, you know, how to, how to sell short fiction and what to do and what not to do and, um, where to send your stories and how to, how to write a cover letter and all that. And I, I, I sort of was, was sick of just hearing the same questions all the time, uh, from beginners. And mostly what, what bothered me was that a lot of beginners just made the same mistake over and over again, mistakes. And one of the worst ones was that they never, they would never send their work, a new story out to the, to the top markets. They'd always start way too low at, at uh, you know, for the love where they get paid in copies or semi pro rates, etc. And, and I was, I had spent so much time talking to new writers and explaining why that was such a bad idea. Um, because it, it really is basically it's taking the story that you wrote and throwing away your chance to have that story uh, start your your publishing career off by selling it to a top market because you can only sell a, a first story you can only sell first rights once so that was one of the impetus and then it just kind of grew from there all right so um you know this whole structure for this video channel is still new to me so i'm coming up with something right now where uh where you guys are talking while i'm doing my thing when i'm done i'll just raise my hand as a, as a visual clue, clue. and I've okay. added uh, a period. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong number in my interface there. There we go. A new period in between these two. The great vampire harvest drives the vampire clans underground. I knew he should have said no vampires. <laughs> <laughs> well, after this, there aren't any. <laughs> uh, do you mean underground as in literally, <laughs> literally. Or underground as in... I mean, like, well, you know, kind of in a way, both like, you know, before this, the vampires were maybe big, large factions manipulating things. Uh, and then when magic disappeared, their their blood was a harvestable resource and suddenly uh, the tables turned on them. Yeah. Okay. And whereas, you know, they used to be maybe like the, the fancy uh, world, uh, world bending uh, rich guy vampires. And now, yeah, they're all hiding in the sewers, the ones that survive. All right. All right, so we've each taken a turn adding an event. Let me call up the rules again. Uh, all right, so Matt, you're still player one. Now it is your turn 
uh, you have to begin by declaring a focus. So when you decide to declare a focus, for the rest of the round, we're all going to add things that are relating to that item. So the okay. focus can be anything on the palette in the yes section or anything that's in an event. So you, um, see, do we have any proper names? No, if we had maybe a proper name, you could focus that. Um, so what are you thinking? So basically the idea you want to see expanded. So are we still just looking at the events, or is there more things we can look at? Could we go to a palette, or...? Yeah, you can go to the, the yes column of the palette. What about legacies? Legacies will come up later. I'll, I'll talk okay. about that when, the, when they're in play. They, they, they kick in after the first round. Okay. Um, I'm kind of liking this act one that we've come up with, and I like that, that, uh, that Doug and I are kind of on the same page of, you know, let's start with some, you know, dramatic affecting the world live on CNN, but CNN is, is um, magic based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so can I, I want to declare my focus on just like the beginning. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, let's give it a name. Um, the initial, what, the magical blackout? The triggering event. Yeah. Which we I haven't like, even like, said why, why it's happened. I like magical blackout. Okay, so go ahead and, and define the focus as the magical blackout. All right. Now, just because this you picked that um, focus to be something on that first period, does not limit us all to that first period. We can have, add events relating to the magical blackout later on. Okay. okay. Um, now, again, as the lens, you have the option to either add a period event or a scene, or add two, but one's nested inside the other. So you can do period and event where you can do event and scene. Okay, I think we're going to add a, an event in the second period. All right, so I was uh, busy working on my thing when you guys were talking about social media. What was that you said you were saying about, uh, Douglas? I was picking up the same thread that I, I think I heard between you and Matt, which was, you know, there's so many authors who, mm -hmm. who just market to other authors, um, other writers. Um, I, I, I not say I'm very good at this, but, you know, I try to reach out to my readers in social media, but probably my main method is, uh, is my newsletter. I keep um, hearing that. Newsletters are really still where it's at. I don't know if they're where, where it's at, but I mean, it's. I enjoy doing them. I've got some very engaged subscribers. I've got ones that I'm sure unsubscribe after a few, mm -hmm. but uh, I sort of keep a, a good core. Um, and it will be interesting. The true test is going to be when I when I watch the trilogy to see uh, sort of how much of a push they can give. Mm -hmm. But I've, I even used them for my beta readers for these books and found out just a great group awesome. subset of them that were uh, really engaged beta readers. I mean, all, right. all, all I promise them is they'll get signed copies of the books and the amount of work they put in on these books so far has just been so, uh, I'm just so grateful for it. Yeah. All right. looks like Matt, you've added an event. Yep. Vampires blame for blackout. Excellent. Oh, good one. Linking that period. Good. All right. So, and it looks like you are not taking the option to add a scene inside there. No, not yet. Okay. Well, I mean, I know, I know it's not my past, but that, that's, that's all my imagination is showing me right now. All right. <laughs> all right. Douglas, now add you, now you're not the lens, but you can add a period, an event, or a scene. Period, event, or a scene. Mm -hmm. Just one of those, right? Yeah. Okay. As all long right. as it relates to the magical black. Yep. Okay, now tell me question, scene, and answer. Okay, so uh, a scene then is like a. Uh, oh, what question the scene is supposed to answer? Right. So if there's something, yeah, like, okay. if there's something, um, for example, say the vamp's blame for a blackout. The question you could be asking is, who started the rumor that the vampires caused a magical blackout? And then okay. uh, this is where the you know the microscope builds itself as a role playing game. This is where the role playing actually happens. There's no yeah. character sheets, there's no dice or anything like that. 
will actually improv a scene. You will create characters, and Matt and I and you will play them to answer that question okay. posed in the scene. When you're talking about your, uh, you know, your own marketing and trying to use social media, and yet yeah, is it is it is a challenge, especially because it's, you know, um, Facebook or uh, Twitter does have lists, so if you want, you can kind of focus down who you who you want to see. But it's it's so pa it's so um, you know transitory. Like you go away for vacation, you're out of internet range, and you come back, and and you know you may have missed something, and you know. I, I, like I do enjoy social media and, and I, I did social media professionally for, for a couple of years when I was working with them. I, I still do work for the Canadian federal government, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like it started and it's certainly serving its function now. But, you know, I think with what Doug was saying about his mailing lists and, and, and people who are beta reading, you know, it's almost like email people are predicting, people have been predicting the death of email for, for 20 years now, yeah. but it is, it does allow that one direct, uh, one-to-one -one almost connection you can have with someone and also the advantage of oh the email comes in you can let it sit in your inbox for even a couple of days but eventually you get to it mm -hmm. but do you have did you say you have a newsletter uh technically in that people can sub uh, subscribe to my blog via their email okay yeah uh but i don't blog much because i don't have much to say right now <laughs> yeah i used to blog a lot it's mm -hmm. funny that when i when i first started having some success writing I would blog a lot uh, about different things because I thought, hey, you know, I've I've sold four short stories. You know, people need to listen. <laughs> to them. And now that I've you know, been doing this for a while, and, and let me and share some, my wisdom to the world. Yeah, <laughs> had some success. It's like I, I I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Don't don't listen to me. My 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 writing process is terrible. But uh, I mean, uh, so yeah, I I mean that's one of the reasons why I really really trimmed back my my website. Uh, was just I wasn't really saying a lot. I didn't have really have a lot out there. But um, I think I'm going to start to open it back up. You know, I, I, people was like always like, oh, you should share. You know, how to write. And I was like, so many people are already doing that. Like I look at Chuck Windig's volume of how to write materials. Like I'm not going to add anything to that body of work. That you know, I have no new epiphanies. So still struggling over that. All right. Oh, I should have mentioned, yeah, so the scene, uh, it looks like, okay, so uh, let's see. Should I not have done all that? No, that's fine. Actually, I should have mentioned this in the rule. So let's see what you have so far. So the big question is, how do the powers that be react to the sudden failing of magic? Ed Poe, detective and single father of Mary and Byron, arrives at the scene of a school bus crash and must deal with the carnage, thoughts of his own kids, and try, oh, wow. Ed determines that a spell that the bus was imbued with has completely vanished with no trace to be found in the vehicle. So um, when you're creating a scene, you have two options. We can we can either act it out or you can dictate it, which is what you've done uh, without me saying so. So I'm actually, you know, you, you've done perfectly fine. Okay, it just seemed, when I see it on the screen here, wow, that's long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually what they usually look like with scenes. Okay, cool. Um, so you've added now three named characters and you know, a specific event there that we can all now pull on. So, yeah, fine. And um, yeah, if, if, if people are not comfortable with role playing, then this is how you add a scene. Perfect. All right, uh, my turn. So you guys go ahead and talk. So, yeah, um, what you and Tone were talking about, I mean, I've, I've never felt comfortable about ever thinking of writing um you know advice on how to craft fiction part of it is you know just why would i think i could presume to add to that and the other one is every writer i know has their their own approach to to first draft and to editing and to coming up with ideas and i, I don't think there is one method and what i would do uh is uh, I find a problem solving technique that works for me is I'll, I'll write about things. And uh, I was saying to Tom, I, I work for the Canadian federal government. So um, what I can say about government and Ottawa being a government town is, is very, very uh, limited, um, which, which, you know, I completely agree with. But before I was in government, I would write letters to the editor of our local paper 
once a month, once every two months or so. But a lot of it, what, how that started was, I'm not quite sure how I feel about this particular issue. So let me just start to write about it. And that's get, got my brain turning and turning. And finally, I'd figure out how I feel about this particular issue. And I would have you know, a couple of paragraphs that I could send to the paper. And I don't know, I'd say about maybe a third of the time they would, they would, they would get published. And cool. so when I started writing uh, a lot of my blog posts, the, the impetus for them was, how do I feel about this? Or what's my thought on this or, or, or doing this thing? So I just start writing and then um, say like, hey, I've got an idea. So let me just post this and maybe somebody can, can learn from it. But it's uh, it's funny. My my number one blog post has been um, about the TV show Community uh, <laughs> yeah. when the third season ended and the hashtag six seasons in a movie came up on the screen. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, that's so brilliant. That's such a call to act like Dan Harmon knows his fans. The creator of Community knows his fans so well that he put up a hashtag uh, for them to kind of say, like, show that you're out there. So I, I, I really love that show and I was moved by that. So I just wrote how I, how that made me feel and that has become like my, uh, my top of blog posts. So, you know, if I can get people interested in me or, or reading something else or curious about, about my work, just do that. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So I've added a period, uh, comes after the vamp great vampire harvest. It's called the false return. Magical sources are restored, but for only 12 days. Matt, you're sure. Oh, I'm going to add. So I'm going to add a scene under uh, the vamps blamed for blackout. All right. So, uh, how how should we do this? Like, what's the um, what's the rules? Okay. So uh, you can simply um, dictate things, like Douglas did with his, or if mm -hmm. you choose, we can role play it out. Uh, so the first thing you got to do is ask yourself a question that this scene is going to answer. Okay. Um. This is a really interesting, really interesting structure. And just as, as an aside, in talking about writing, you know, um, good scenes should always begin in a certain situation, and then something changes, and then you end. And you know, we all we all know the the scenes we've all had to write or we've had to read, like Harry and Hermione in the goddamn tent. Uh, and I'm assuming profanity, mild profanity, is okay. You're not going to have to believe that. That's fine. Yeah. Like in the tent and the reason is that nothing changes and it seems like that scene goes on for like pages and pages and pages but i went back and it's really it's only like two two or three pages but everybody knows ron and hermione in the scene in the in the tent but i think the answer is nothing is asked nothing is answered in that scene so to come back to this um you know what's the question what's the scene what's the answer that's really really mm -hmm. an interesting way to force you as the writer to say you can't just have a scene where things move around or where nothing happens something has to happen so Okay, so while you're working on that, I want to ask Douglas. So, what do you what do you put in your newsletter? Oh well, um, early on, I decided to you know invest in creating individual ebooks for all my short stories, or the ones that have been published to that point. So, um, and got pro covers for them all, and I figured, well, this is an investment that will never pay back. Um, <laughs> You can you can buy them all, and I actually have recovered my investment of by people buying the short story ebooks on the various retailer sites. But I use nice. them as my my uh, you know my reader cookie. Um, so if you sign up for my newsletter, you get an Aurora award winning short story ebook. Um, and then each month, I send out um, the first thing is here's your free ebook of the of story short story of the month, and they get a different uh, short story every month. Um, and I have just just finished going through the um, my entire inventory, <laughs> so I'm, I'm time to write uh, some more short stories. Well, yeah, but then I, I don't put them up until they've been sold and published in a in a pro market. So mm -hmm. um, I'm starting to cycle through, but that's that's fine. I think that people who like my writing will stay on, and the ones who have joined recently haven't seen these as uh, reader cookies before. And then I talk about my uh, any writing news. I've been keeping them updated on sort of the pace of my trilogy, etc. Um, I've had I try to put in something that's sort of just of general interest. So like when COVID started, I was if I if I found cool 
you know, here is a site where you can watch online performances of, of you know, symphony orchestras or your favorite rock band or whatever. I'd put those things in. Um, online games, that was the whole thing. And I had a lot of people who came back and, and you know, provided their own sites for uh, cool um, online gaming sites that you can play with your family while you're in quarantine, etc. So stuff like that. You're just trying to find a way to get them engaged and to uh, get them to respond. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've, like I said, my my newsletter is my blog, and it's kind of fizzled out just because, you know, first when Live Journal was new, me and my friends were all just spewing out every thought we had, and I think we all just kind of ran out of thoughts to have. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the the regularity is is important. So I've I've I made the commitment to uh, when people sign up, I tell them that two things: one, I will not email you more than once a month, and two, I will email you once a month. So they <laughs> will you can't do get once a month. I mean. Yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, so they know that the they're not, I'm not going to bug them, but they will get a free ebook every month. So it's forces me to to keep to a schedule and not suddenly realize, wow, it's been half a year and I haven't said anything. Yet. Okay. Oh, boom. All right, Matt, care to read that off? So oh, it's uh, the scene. The question is, are the vampires hoarding the magic? And the, the event that's going to happen is our friend Ed is going to lead raids on vampire locations and these raids are brutal. And um, I'm just thinking about them. I, I saw a couple of presentations because it's Pride Week here in, in Ottawa mm -hmm. about uh, the bathhouse raids in Toronto and oh. the Stonewall riot. And so I'm just thinking that these are, because I'm imagining vampires are probably in this universe, no sexy, sparkly vampires, even though I don't think we put that down in the rules. But that's a given. Um, We're all they're, 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 they're not quite the you know mindless um, 42 days of night vampires, but more that than than edward or whatever the hell his name was from twilight <laughs> but um so anyway so they lead the raids uh vampires are basically considered they would be considered people but they're not really like so they have some rights but these raids are just off the charts brutal mm -hmm. and the answer is that no the vampires are suffering worse than humans since uh their survival on blood has a magical basis it's not just biological and because the magic is fading the vampires are becoming more animalistic and the human elements of their personalities are starting to fade. All right. Okay. Now, something I neglected to say is that because you're the lens and we're revisiting your focus, you did have the option to have another nested thing, but you created a scene anyway, so it doesn't sound like you were going to do that. Would that be fair? Nested thing? What uh, do you mean by nested thing? Oh, um, uh, because he's the lens, when he comes back around to his own focus, uh, just like in his first round, he was able to create uh, a period and an event inside it, or an event with a scene inside it. He had that option to do that now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So cool. I could not create a new period. No, you could have created a new period. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm then just then saying I'm like... you could create two event, uh, two of these things instead of one. Oh, okay. Then I think I'm going to create. As long as one was nested inside the other, but you created a scene, so it looks like you weren't thinking along those lines. Okay. Okay. All right. So that was our first round on the focus magical blackout. Now we're going to get into the legacy. Um, so it's the player that sort of came after. So since we started with Matt, that's going to be me since I'm higher up on the list. Now I get to, to pick something that was introduced here, declare it a legacy, and I can create a period event or a scene relating to it. And I don't have, I'm not beholden to the focus. So this is sort of a way of sort of um, giving a little bit more space to what we've created already. So I'm going to be thinking on that when you guys go ahead and talk. What what function does a legacy play? I think it's to keep things from getting a little too uh, tunneled, right? So, um, and also it's a way of, of me, um, if there's something here I really like, I get to embellish it a little bit. Okay. You know? now, that was a question I had myself, and as I'm playing the game, I, that's what I think the purpose is. Right. Is, it, is it like a subplot, or is it simply another uh, aspect? I think it's. It would be maybe. I'm trying to compare it to. Um, on Babylon Five, there was that episode that. Fo actually, even better. 
in in X Files, there would be that one episode that focused on the lone gunsman. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think it kind of serves that purpose. It's like here's some guys that are never going to be the focus of the story, but we're going to give you a little extra. Cool. Okay. Got it. Doug, I was only half listening. You're talking about how um, the newsletter keeps you disciplined that you send it once a month, but you send it once a month without fail. Yeah, within the month. I mean, I've, and there's been months where I've 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 slipped, and it's like you know, my July uh, newsletter went out August first, I think. So, <laughs> and I, I'll just say that. Okay, guys, sorry, missed that month. We're gonna we're gonna start over, and and I'll. You know, I'll try to make sure we, we keep it in the month from now on. But uh, as long as it's more or less regular. Um, and um, yeah, you, new sorters are, are, are strange beasts. You know, I've got a, a core group that seem to open every newsletter and respond to me and answer polls and things like that. And, and others that might open the first couple and then they never open them again. So you, you kind of have to do some pruning on your on your list. Um, to make sure you've um, you're keeping because I, I I keep it focused uh, um, as the number of subscribers go up you end up having to pay pay more so you want to make sure oh, you really? have people who aren't even opening up opening up the uh, the newsletter. What are you using uh, software wise for the newsletter? Well, I'm still on Mailchimp, um, which is uh, probably not the best option anymore but i'm um i'm kind of loath to try to move to something else that hasn't been on my top priority miller miller light seems be to a, be the other one yeah that can be a big chore is moving services like that yeah, I'm, I'm afraid people are you know they've got me um it comes from my email address so maybe it won't be a problem of ending up in spam filters but uh i just i just worry about uh doing the, the shift over so I haven't haven't attempted it yet, and I've sort of trained myself on all the peculiarities of, of Mailchimp when you're doing the design and composing a newsletter. So, yeah. do you have a newsletter, Matt, or have you considered one? No, I I, I don't. Um, I haven't really considered it. Um, just uh, you know, don't don't know if anybody would. Be interested, and also just the uh, the time and the and the investment to, to do it. Uh, right now, I'm putting almost all my focus uh, into the novel. I mean, it's, it's yeah. been around for a long time, and you know, I should I should get it out the door. Uh, but this has really been a learning experience. This is um third novel I finished. The first two I was I was in university, so we're not we will we will not discuss those. They will never see the light of day. <laughs> uh, yeah, and true. and started a couple others, but it's really. You know, I've always understood, but this is really getting into the guts of uh, a novel is really a, a completely different beast than short stories. I mean, the only thing they they have in common is is they're both prose forms, but they're uh, they're they're very different in how they in how they work and how they function. And I think the first draft I approached it too much like a short story, and you know, in in, in so like in, in short fiction, you might have a character doing whatever, and then while well, there was an event that happened before that scene that, that you're reading, but it really doesn't need to have its own scene. So you can say, you know, earlier that day, da, 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 da. and I found I was, and, and that's a good way to save, save space. When you're writing short yeah. fiction, you, you want to have your story as short as possible. That's part of the, the art form. But I found I was doing that a lot with the novel and realized I can just have a really short chapter that might be a page or two that is showing what happened rather than telling what happened. Uh, and so needing to go back and do that and, uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 learn from that. So anyway, but that my my focus right now, my creative focus is is on the novel. So I've got a couple of short stories that are out making circulating rounds. I'm not really writing any short fiction because I want to get this yeah uh, I, this piece yeah. done. I remember that journey, Tony. You're finished. I am finished. So I've picked Mary Poe as our legacy, and I added the event under the false return. Mary Poe is falsely given credit for the return which is a light event for her in the short run. Okay. So Fault there might be a, another okay, event cool. relating her uh, where the truth comes out, which would be maybe a dark event for her. 
Okay, so um, now I can I can add a period, I can add okay. events, I can add scenes. Oh, no, because we're going to a new focus. So, you, oh. Douglas, you are now the lens. So you get to pick Woo. a new focus for us. Okay, all right. Define focus. So I hit define focus here, right? There we go. And again, you can pick anything from every, the only thing that's off limits is the no column. Yeah. Well, I guess our personal names too. You probably don't want to. Uh, you can inject us <laughs> as characters. So is it just the title I put in here? Uh huh. Okay, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, put your name in parentheses afterwards to help me keep track of who the focus, uh, who the lens is. Sure. Okay, I'm Search done. for the cause. All right. The cause of the loss of magic, obviously. All right. All right. Uh, so now, because you're the lens, you just defined a focus. You can add a period event or a scene, and you can also add a, a nested element inside that. Okay. Right. So while you're thinking, I'm going to ask Matt. So, what's your approach to writing short stories? I haven't written too many myself, um, and I use the um, what was it? Mary, what's that, that uh, nursery rhyme about Mary and the porridge and the spider? I have no idea. <laughs> and I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. I shows how rarely I write short stories because I can't even remember it. it Mary the uh, sits on the spider, sits, all oh, right. Anyway, Mary, Mary, <laughs> quite contrary, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider Thank and you. sat down beside her and scared for Mary away or something like that. I yeah, think. that's my short story outline. Introduce <laughs> character, status quo, something happens to change events, consequences, and so what, uh, you have a probably more sophisticated way of doing it. So before I start uh, a story, I want to make sure that I have all the elements down. I know who the main character is, uh, why we're rooting for them, because uh, that's the problem I find with the short fiction is that you have a character and they're they're just there. And it's like, you're supposed to follow this person and I don't care anything about them. So the stuff we learned in English class, so character, setting, uh, what do they want, um, basic plot outline. So what's what gets the story moving? What is the character trying to do? Um, what, is, what is the ending? And so I've got a notebook full of um, just different ideas and sometimes I can kludge them all together into something sometimes it comes to me all, all at once but before I start I want to have those things down and kind of the idea of how am I going to reward the reader for their time mm -hmm. um, and so it uh, and, and also is this something is this a story that I want to tell but you know that's 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 basic storytelling but for me I think what what's really important for me is theme and I find that theme uh, is what helps makes decisions and helps me to, to, to know where the story wants to go. So um, as an example, I, a story that I, I've got making the rounds right now, the, the idea was we've all read haunted house stories. Mm -hmm. I said, what's an unusual haunted location? And the first one I came up with was a haunted police car. And the idea was I had a character who is put in the back of a cop car and, you know, in cuffs and the cop car is haunted and what happens to them. Couldn't make that work, but then I thought haunted school bus. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, okay, that's interesting. And so began to play with that, began to play with that as I, I was uh, kind of exploring what would the haunting mechanics be of a school bus, came to realize that this was a story about toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. And once that theme came to me and I'm like, okay, this is really a story and you don't, it's not like I'm beating you over the head with it. It's just something that, that I know it really helped me figure out, okay, what's the setting and what's the core of the different characters and how the character dynamics is going to to uh, to happen. So if you ask me, what's the story about that? I'm like, oh, it's it's um about a guy. He's new. He's new to a town, and he and a and a friend of his spend the night on a abandoned school bus. It turns out to be haunted. Nice. And if you say, but what's it really about? I could say, well, it's really an exploration of toxic masculinity and how it is toxic and it is trying uh, to kill you. And there's a difference between. What I think is is 
positive elements of, of, of masculinity and, and the masculine identity and some of the, the toxic elements. So I guess, I guess my approach is I really need to know what the story is really about before I'm going to start to put it down on paper. But then it can take me 5, 10, 15 drafts <laughs> before we finally have something that, that I'm happy with. Right. Which is not good. Don't don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your stories are good, Matt. So worth Thanks, worth Doug. the effort. All right, Doug. Looks like you've added an event. I. Uh, it looks like you also froze up for a second there. What was it again? Sorry, um, you guys are not freezing, so I'm okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I added the period, the search for the cause which is now the second period, and the event is panic spreads through the city as fatalities rise, and then the way humans do. Some marginalized groups are targeted as causing the magical blackout. All right. All right, now it's my turn. So go ahead, go ahead, you guys go ahead and talk. Let's talk about tone. Make him really <laughs> nervous. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, you know, um, how to start stories. I mean, I think... I, I think every writer is, is different. You know, you, you need to find out what the story is about. I often start with that. I can't start writing a story, short or novel, until I really, really know my characters. Like, I just, they have no trouble putting them on the page because to me, they're real. And until I do that, I can't, I can't write anything. I'm interested in your, in your novel. You know, that was the first time you moved to long length, if we ignore the, the two from university days. Um, the, the classic of pantser versus outliner. I mean, did, how, how did you go about telling that story? Like, did you just dive in and start writing? Did you do a full outline? Did you sort of do a rough outline? What? No, I, what did, did, a, um, I did a full outline. This is a story uh, you know, that, that I've been writing for, I think uh, the date, um, It'll be almost five years since I started the first draft, but I did it in dribs and drabs, and I was writing a lot of short fiction along the way. Uh, but this is a story that the idea came to me. When was Hale Bop, the comet? 1997, I think. Oh, wow, and, um, sorry, don't know. Uh, uh, it, I was driving back from, um, uh, I was making a pretty long road trip, and it was, um, it was nighttime, and I was in upstate New York, and so pitch black uh, on, a, on a state road. So I don't even think there were street lights, or if they were, there were a few and far between. But in the sky, and I forget in which order, but it was like the moon, which was, uh, I'm just looking at my screen. So like there was the moon, which I think was an eclipse. So it was red, the planet Mars, and then the yeah. comet Hale Bop. Wow. Uh, and I remember Hale Bop because that was the, uh, the Heaven's Gate suicide uh, in, in California. And I was like, this is a sign, and this is a sign to somebody. And the moon is red, and Mars, of course, is red. And I, I got the just the word redstone came into my head, and that's the name of the city where the, the story takes place. And thought, well, who would this be a sign to? And I, I began to just explore this kind of Randall Flagg type guy, but I needed to make him different than Randall Flagg. Um, and uh, I, I just started to thought, well, what if he came to the, the small city where I was living at the time, and what, what would happen? And so I've, I'd had this this story kind of in different scenes and different elements just kicking around in my head for a long time. And um, I just hit a point in my writing where I realized I need to write a novel. And I had a couple of ideas uh, sketched out. And I talked them over with with a friend of mine, Derek Koonskin, who is a, uh, an Ottawa-based writer of, of hard science fiction and, and just brilliant. Uh, oh. And he helped me solidify on this idea. And so I just took the different scenes that I'd had the different ideas, started to put them down on paper, arrange them, rearrange them. So I had a pretty detailed outline um, uh, to to write from. And so I followed uh, Lovecraft's advice, um, which was come up with your outline, um, then what was it? It's like come up with your outline, write your story based on your outline, but change the story if the outline no longer works. And then there's there's a third step. So I I did some some plotting, I did some pantsing, and had a, a finished manuscript that I then set aside and didn't, didn't go back to it until a That's year key. later. Yeah. And then just um, yeah. did, did a, an exercise that an, another writing friend of mine here in Ottawa named Kate Hartfield told me, which is you re-outline, which is you take the outline you had, you set it aside, you, you don't go back to it. 
but then you read through your novel and you write an outline based on what's actually down on the page. And that can let you know scenes you need to add, things you can get rid of, um, what's working, what's not working. And then working from the, the second outline allowed me to approach the, the edits with both, I got a feel for this and I really want to redo this scene because it's kind of clunky. And also here, like you were talking about, here are some real structural changes that I need to make because right now the story is is broken without them. Yeah, yeah. I did, in my first novel, I did a full outline. I more or less stuck to it, but similar to what you said, you know, if I, if I realized this wasn't going to work, I, I changed it. The way I write now is I sort of, I know, I know my inciting event. I know sort of the big, um, use a Hollywood scriptwriter term, the, the tent poles. I write in three X structures. So I, at what's going to happen at the end of Act One, Act Two, and, and how I'm going to wrap it all up, and then I, I I write in kind of three to four, five chapter chunks, and I just get them where I'm happy with them, and then I'll look ahead to say what's what's the next set of chunks I'm going to write. So I'm sort of my outlining is more targets. I call it headlights on the highway. I think that came from a quote by Eli Doctorow, where he said, "Writing a novel." is like um, driving across the desert at night. You can only see as far as your headlights show you of the road, but you can cross the entire desert that way. And that's kind of what I'm doing. I can, I write as far as I see the headlights going. I write that chunk and then I see where the road is going to turn for the next. So it's, uh, but I, I know what my destination city is and I know maybe a couple of stopping points on the way. So that's, that's how I describe my approach and it's, uh, it really works for me. Right. Tell when you're done. Yes, I did. Uh, I've added some yellow journalism. So underneath the, the event you just created, I added who shifted the blame toward the vampires. Uh, the scene is in the offices of the Occult Times Supernatural newspaper. The staff is overwhelmed by the violence caused by the drought. And editor John Riley has an idea to sell more papers and mitigate the damage by placing the, van the blame for the event on the least popular supernatural faction, the vampires. Beautiful. I love how all this is coming together. Mm -hmm. It's it's wonderful. Like I mean, this game is 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 has its own kind of magic where we we started with like literally a blank slate and we just build out this whole continuity. I want to read this damn thing. Come on, let's <laughs> get it done. <laughs> All right, so that was my turn. So Matt, please add a period, event, or a scene. So Tona, obviously you've used microscope before. Mm -hmm. But had you had you had any experience in collaborating and like creative collaboration, whether it be a story, a book, a, a whatever? Nothing that got this? off the ground. Um, when I first when I first re discovered my interest in writing, I had been working in software. Originally, I wanted to, my creative endeavor was going to be to work in the video game industry, and that's why I got a bachelor's degree in math because I had heard that. Um, that was a valuable thing in that industry. However, I also had a friend who was, he worked on the first Fallout game, and I watched him oh, okay. work uh, through crunch time and then get laid off just as they were supposed to get their completion bonus. I was like, maybe the video game industry is not where I want to work. Uh, but I did find myself working in other software for a while, and I was, I was doing accounting software for Boeing, which was not creatively inspiring. Um, you yeah, think? <laughs> Um, and then one Comic Con, a friend, my friend Dan and I came up with an idea to do a new DC uh, take on the Secret Six, which was one of their old properties. And just us bouncing ideas off each other, that was like, like oh, yeah, this is, this is what I really enjoy doing. This is what I find fulfilling. So, um, so I did that. And then I, you know, we've tried with other people um, working off things that never happened. Probably the closest thing I got to that was. Uh, comic book pitch I did called Dead Women, which was, it's a fantasy about, it's basically the Seven Samurai, but it's a vampire, a ghost, a zombie, a poltergeist, etc. Um, and uh, I, with that one, I gave a lot of creative control just over to the artist. So I wrote a very minimalist script and let her fill out what things looked like and where they were and such as that. And that was an interesting experience kind of. To you know, to sort of spit an idea out and have it come back at you, uh, just yeah. slightly changed and feel fleshed out. Interesting. I had I had a brief excursion into um, writing writing for comic books. There was um, um, a 
product that someone had developed. They had the IP ownership and they came to a Toronto uh, comic um, book company and they wanted to, they were launching a, a um, TV video series, like an online video series for the, for the concept. They wanted to have a, um, a comic book come out that mirrored the first season. So I actually wrote the, there were two writers, so he and I were going to alternate which issue. He'd start with the first issue, I did the second. And then they had, uh, they had an artist, so they'd have a consistent artist to look for the, for the, the issues, obviously. So uh, it was quite fun. I, I, I had not done that before. Um, I got the job, one, because they were looking for Canadian writers in, in fantasy. Uh, and also because I was able to show them a partially complete, completed um, graphic novel script for one of my stories. Uh, but yeah, that was like crash course on how, how the hell do you write a comic book script? <laughs> and um, it was fun because I love movies and a lot of it is I love the visual aspect of, of defining a frame in, in the comic. Uh, but we had the same discussion with the artist about, yeah, you're telling me a lot that most writers leave it to me, right? Just <laughs> tell me what, what, the, what you want this frame to, to do and I'll, I'll, I'll draw it. But uh, so it was interesting collaboration. I see Matt's ready, but I just want to add like uh, my first uh, how to read, uh, write comic books was to take Alan Moore scripts and use that as my baseline. That's a mistake because oh, he, really? writes, he, he will write a whole page of text to describe what's happening in a panel. Okay. And notoriously, the writers, who, uh, the artists who work with him have to have somebody else sort of whittle that down to what they really need to read <laughs> to, right. to actually draw stuff. Right. All right, Matt, what you added? I hope that's in keeping with the focus. If I'm if I'm if I'm off focus, uh, let's see. Search for the cause. Mary Poe builds a steam engine to generate electrical power to pillage. Mm, I mean, you're pushing it. Uh, what do you think? How can we break this a little bit uh, more in line with the focus? Oh, the, the focus being um, search, for the, search for the cause. Yeah. yeah. That's that's sort of a search for the solution. Mm -hmm. I like it though. Let's see. And Mar okay, the Mary I, I name ca came from uh, from Mary Shelley, so I went with Ed Poe and Mary and Byron. So I was so a Frankenstein reference of her building something is is uh, with oh, the city is actually quite cool. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit this. Okay. I like the idea of, of, you know, scientifically generating electricity, having it viewed as magic. Mm -hmm. You know, in the early days, electricity were like static electricity was something that people would pay a ticket to see. Some yeah, guy with a, yeah. a glass rod and a silk, a silk handkerchief. Look, it's stuck. Yeah, uh, wasn't that the part of the New York World's Fair in the That's, late eighteen hundreds, yeah. early nineteen hundreds? All right, so you edited it. Go ahead and read that off. Wait, hold on, sorry, something in edit didn't go all the way through. Okay, so Mary Mary Poe, and I guess we're gonna have to make her either either Ed is older, so Mary's an adult or um, kind of girl genius. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Poe trying to find the cause accidentally generates electricity, which is seen as magical. Excellent. There we go. Love it. So um, we don't know how many years happen between Mar when Mary Poe is introduced and when Mary yeah. Poe discovers that. You know, so yeah. don't don't worry about timeline. That's when you play this game. They really encourage you to not um, put dates on things, specific dates, because okay. it, it keeps you this flexibility. And something I forgot to mention, we didn't do it anyway. But in the, the the rules of the game, there's no immortals and there's no time travel. And you know immortals because they kind of be tend to be nails in the, yeah. the story, and no time travel because we as players are already jumping around in time. So if you have characters jumping around in time too, then everything becomes flat again. Yeah. All right. Um, and now Douglas, we're back to your focus. So you add one more uh, period, event, or scene, and if you like, one of those nested inside that. Okay, so I can do two, but mm -hmm. one within the other. Mm -hmm. Okay.
So Matt, you went to school for English? Uh, originally I went uh, for engineering. Oh, really? Yeah, I, uh, I'm originally from Connecticut and there was at the time um, a very, very large part of our economy was uh, defense contracting. So we have electric boat, which makes submarines. We have Sikorsky, which makes helicopters. Colt was there. So uh, engineering was was a really good job to get in, in that state. But um, I, uh, I I changed majors to psychology just because I didn't I didn't like that engineering there is only one right answer <laughs> and it, it kind of I, I kind of got a bit uh, bored with it I mean it was challenging academically but it just really wasn't stimulated by the subjects and I'd taken a couple of psychology courses as as electives or as um, as uh, social science credits and just really really liked it and liked the research element of it that combined a certain amount of creativity in your research design but also hard mathematics on, on the back end. If you can't support your hypothesis with the statistics or the data that you've gathered, you can't really say that your theory is, is correct. So um, that's that's what I did uh, for, for undergrad, although not a lot of jobs for somebody with just a bachelor's in, in psychology. Same thing for just a bachelor's in math. Yeah. So what'd you, what, what's your day job now? Uh, I work for the federal government. I work oh, for the right. Department of uh, Transportation here, yeah, and that. I work in the communications shop. Oh, nice. Um, what does that involve? You said you used to do social media. Yeah, I got into. Um, it's funny that uh, when I was when I was still in university, we had uh, a, a guy who lived in in, um, in my dormitory was kept telling us about this thing called the internet, and this was <laughs> the early nineties. So the web. Either the web was brand brand new or hadn't quite been been founded yet. I mean, there's there's still DARPAnet and all that, but the the, the web, the World Wide Web, really wasn't hadn't taken off yet. And so uh, I got online in in the, the early '90s and uh, was really fascinated by by just the concept of the internet. And when I got my first job out of after school, said to my boss, and this was this is now the late '90s or mid mid '90s, mid, mid to late '90s. Hey boss, we should have a website. Thinking we'll hire somebody, and he said, do it. I said, I don't know how. And so he said, learn, because I'm not going to pay somebody else to, for, for that work. And so uh, I got into to web uh, at, at that point, and I've been working with online communications uh, ever since, because what I my focus with, with getting involved with the web was the communications element, not necessarily the technical element. Though I understand the underlying technology, I'm more about what's on the screen versus what's, what's behind it. So uh, when social media first started to... Uh, uh, to become a thing and, and sort of appearing in, in the, the news. I wanted to learn about it and, and did. And um, I got a job in, in government because they wanted somebody who understood what this new social media thing was. And this was maybe uh, 10, 12 years ago. But uh, I've, I've been in government working in online communications uh, ever since, which is a really, really big challenge uh, for government of uh, because it's such a large, large organization trying to figure out, okay, but what do we want to say uh, is, is a challenge with the web now as the main source of information for communications. Uh, that it's, a, it's, it's a really challenging and really interesting uh, field of work to, to be in. How's it going? Because, you know, if you're a company and you've got your website, it's, we want to buy stuff from us. Yeah. And government <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have that. So what is it that we're, that we're trying to say? It's going slowly. Keep talking. <laughs> so I guess what I'll what I'll add to that, just to, to, so we don't have dead air, is um, what what I find interesting is my my undergrad in psychology, even though it's it's you know over twenty years ago now, but just the notion of the discipline of planning out what you want to to do and what you want to say, what are the steps that are going to take to get there, understanding your your audience, mm -hmm. uh, and that they have different needs and, and different wants. Uh, and then also gathering some data at the end to try to figure out if you were successful has really, really helped me as a communicator because writing skills that are involved, uh, there's organizational skills that, that that's involved. And, and um, luckily, I don't have to worry about design because I'm a terrible designer. But uh, it, it's funny that this this undergrad degree that I thought was just, okay, this was, this was interesting, but unless I want to get a PhD, there's really not a lot I can do with it. I'm finally, many years later, being able to put those skills that I learned in my undergrad days. It's funny how uh, sometimes somebody's day job sort of reflects in their writing. So yeah. I was in a writer's workshop with a guy who was uh, 
a contracts lawyer. And man, that guy was a good proofreader. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, his day job is is all about if, you know, a comma in the wrong place can cost a company millions. Yep. Yeah. There, there was, I remember there was, I remember that lawsuit uh, about where the comma was placed and, and what it, um, what it implied. Mm -hmm. I forget the exact details and specifics of it, but yeah, it did come down to that one comma. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't um, put, the internet and technology does play a lot in, uh, in my stories, but I don't write a lot about government except for one story that is in the collection uh, called The Machinery of Government. Uh, and it is set right here in, in Ottawa, which is the, the capital of Canada, uh, not Toronto for, for the Americans who are, who are watching, it's, it's Ottawa. Uh, but it's about uh, an attack on the city by a foreign adversary, and it's a newly minted um, cabinet secretary mm -hmm. is, uh, has to react and, and force that of the city. Uh, and it's sudden, so he, he's caught uh, unawares. But, um, you know, Doug was talking about the research that he did. And so I found with the story I had to do, a tremendous amount of research to figure out. All right, if you're if you're a minister uh, in in the gov in the government, um, which is like the head of a department. I forget what they're called. I think in the states they're more they're more called secretaries, but here they're ministers. Uh, you're also a member of parliament. You're also a member of of the legislature if if you're the minister. What would your day look like? Would you you know do you take vacations? How would you be getting information uh, if there wasn't a an attack on the city, who would come for you? How would they come for you? How would you be communicating? Mm -hmm. And so I needed to know all of that. And luckily I was working in government at the time when I wrote it. So I, I talked to different people and said, hey, what, you know, how, what, what, what would, you know, what are the answers to those questions? And so there's a lot of, um, hang on a second, guys, I got to step away. Invisible details uh, in that story um, that I had, I know I had to get right, that probably most people will pick up on but if i got it wrong people who know would uh, would know about it so that was a you know that's kind of how my my day job intruded into it. for me it's uh, my programming experience i think of scenes as functions where yeah. something comes in and something comes out and it gets changed in the middle and sometimes yep. like you know your global variables would be you know there but you good policy is one thing out one thing one thing in one thing out very minimal like global changes i try and keep scenes very tight that way whereas my first experience writing when i was before i learned a program it would be like here's the scene and vomit up everything that's implied from it yeah. all right okay, so, i'm uh, back sorry guys yeah, no worries okay. uh douglas what you got for us i'm not thrilled with this but um under under the search for the cause, we have Byron, who is Ed's uh, son, and his friends stumble on a strange cult, worship, worshiping an unearthly vehicle. Oh, interesting. So basically, I've introduced aliens. <laughs> All right. So now that's uh, your full round is focused. Matt, you get to pick a new legacy, and you add that to the existing list. So you... Um, you, you pick a legacy, add to the list, but you do have the option of exploring Mary Poe when you add an event if you want. Okay. So it has to be something that was introduced in the last round when you added a legacy. Okay. So, Tony, you, you, you mentioned something about when you rediscovered writing. I was just wondering what... Uh... Uh, what happened? What brought you back to it when you started and when you stopped and such? I had a creative writing class in high school. I think I did pretty well at it. I had my own thing going, uh, style certainly going on there. Um, but early on as a kid, especially like a, a very introverted kid, I realized I didn't know much about life. So that's why, that was part of the reason I joined the Marine Corps, uh, just to get out of you know my bedroom uh, and experience some things. Uh, from the Marine Corps, then it was um, my creative interest first went to film, but uh, this is, I got out of the Marine Corps in 93, so was the Great Recession was happening. I was like, I can't move to LA and, and expect to live there and try and get started in that. And the new, fairly new medium of video games was coming up. So I, that's where my creative interest went. So that's, and that's steered my, my, my path through college. Um, cool. And then after college, I was like, I've learned all this stuff. Why, why would I waste it making video games anyway? Uh, 
started working in tech. And then, like I said, I ended up at Boeing and it was still something missing, you know, from my life is being able to come yeah. up with that, you know, something escapism really create my own escapism. Cool. Uh, so yeah. And then <laughs> I mentioned the, the list that became the, the manifesto for the book is like a lot of people will actually educate themselves on the process of writing. But me, I was just like, well, I read books. It doesn't seem that hard. I just knock one out. You, um, you learn to write by writing and yeah. reading a lot. So, yeah. yeah. Which uh, a lot of people I know with you know MFAs really hate it when I say, yeah, I just wrote a book and it got published. I, I had a friend who um, I met him uh, at a, a workshop that uh, Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith uh, put on. And he'd done an MFA. And I remember him after one of Chris's lectures, just kind of off by himself, just swearing. And I asked him, what's going on? He said, I just realized that I'm going to have to unlearn everything they taught me. Oh, wow. What was it? What was the implication of that? I mean, the implication was, I, and I, I still personally believe this, that, you know, the, the, what they teach you in university at that level in creative writing is how to deconstruct, not how to construct or create. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah he, uh, he, he basically realized he thought he'd wasted his time getting the MFA. Yeah. I have to step away again. I'll be back. Okay. Well, I think Matt's done, so we'll just talk about what he's contributed. So I've added a legacy, and, and let me know if I, I got this right. So I'm going to, the legacy is going to be the unearthly vehicle. Oh, excellent. And because we're still in the focus of the search for the cause, I've added an event at the end that the technology of the unearthly vehicle is shared among the powers that be. Okay. So you whoever, did, when you whoever they are. Uh, the legacy, you were not beholden to the focus, but it's, oh, okay. fine, it's fine that you did. Uh, all right. It's, it's, I, I like what you guys were saying about um, uh, unlearning what, what, what was learned because um, I, I sometimes catch uh, catch flack from people because I'm a big fan of, of three act structure, and people say, "Oh, that's that's formula, that's formula," and I'm like, "It's formula if it's prescriptive, if you absolutely have to follow it." But what I find is understanding that uh, how three act structure works, I use it as a tool to be descriptive, mm -hmm. because I might be writing and find that this story just takes forever to get started. As me, the author, when I'm going back and, and rereading it, it just takes forever, and it's oh you don't have the inciting incident until three or four pages in. So if you understand how story structure works and you can find that weakness, you can go back and then, and then add it in. And I mean, I, I've got some stuff in my collection that really doesn't follow structure. doesn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to map it to it, but I like, I like it as a diagnostic tool. Like you're talking about where a scene and, uh, and, and a chapter if a chapter is just a single scene is a function. And there's a, um, uh, uh, I, there's a workshop that that I that I teach not not now obviously, but it's called maintaining tension in, in 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 stories, and it's a couple of different techniques. And one of them is understanding how a scene works, where you begin a scene with the characters want something, uh, they try to get it but they fail, they learn something along the way that allows them to get what they want, and then the scene ends with they have what they want, and then that will propel them on to something else. And uh, I use that just to kind of break down. Uh, was it Dan Brown who wrote The Da Vinci Code? Yeah. Yeah. And everyone says, oh, my God, The Da Vinci Code. It's such a great thrill. It's such a great thriller. Like, it's, it's a real page turner. And when I read it, I said, the genius of this book is like, it, it, very creative with the different, you know, the different elements going on. But it's where he ended his chapters that increased the tension. Mm -hmm. So you, you could probably take The Da Vinci Code and cut where the chapters end. And you know, move that around, and it's going to be a lot less thrilling. What he did is he ended every every chapter with a question being asked, and the next chapter answers that question, and so then the, that chapter ends with a question being asked. I like what what what, the, what what this is doing, but it's it's mechanics. It's understanding how to use those mechanics, but nothing can really replace the creativity of of, um, of the stories. That it's not like there's there aren't structures to pick from. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, you're not. We're not all going to that same well. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, to bring Douglas up to speed, Matt Adder added, uh, wanted to embellish the unearthly vehicle. So he added in the final period there an event where uh, then technology is shared among the powers that be. And that's like. Cool. 
So right. I was I was thinking that it was sort of the going to be the cause of why magic went away, but you've also worked it into the solution, so that's cool. All right, so we're coming up on two hours right now. Um, if you guys like, we can maybe revisit this next week, do another episode, or are you done? I I do this again. Yeah, this is fun. All right, cool. Uh, is this time work for you guys? Uh, so actually, let me check next Saturday. You know, let's worry about that after we're done recording. <laughs> yeah, it's the long weekend, but all right. Well, uh, so let's go over anything. Was anyone anyone care to read the first period off and you know, give a summary of that? I'll go, I'll go so, because I like I like this uh, this opening. So um, the opening is everything was fine until the magic disappeared, and so what happened was there was a uh, transportation accident where a. Um, the school bus uh, crashed, and the investigator, Ed Poe, who's father of two, has discovered that uh, the spell that would make the school bus go has completely vanished, and there's no trace of that. And then things get even worse when the magic in hospitals and medical facilities begins to fail throughout the city of Toronto. All right. Uh, Douglas, would you like to read the second period? The search for the cause. Panic spreads throughout the city as fatalities rise. Some marginalized groups are targeted as causing the magical blackout. In a local newspaper, the Occult Times, everyone is trying to um, come up with a reason what is, what's caused this. The staff is totally overwhelmed by all the, um, the events, the deaths, the violence that have been caused by the disappearance of magic. And the editor of that, that newspaper, Jonathan Riley, gets an idea to sell more papers, try to mitigate the damage by placing the blame on the least popular of the supernatural factions in the population, the vampires. At the same time, Byron, who is Ed Poe's young son and his friends, stumble on a strange cult, worshiping what seems to be an unearthly vehicle. And the next period of the Great Vampire Harvest drives the vampire clans underground as they're being har uh, harvested for their magical energy. They were also blamed for the blackout in general. Uh, are the vampires hoarding magic? Ed Poe, the detective from earlier, leads a raids on vampire locations. The raids are brutal because the vampires are brutal, but ultimately they discover vampires were not harvesting the magic. They were suffering worse, in fact, than uh, humans since their survival on blood is a magical but not biological basis. They're becoming more feral than ever. Matt? And so um, at some point, uh, magic does seem to return to the world, but it only lasts for 12 days. And among this time, uh, Mary Poe, uh, Ed Poe's daughter, uh, trying to find what caused it accidentally generates electricity, which some see as, as magical. And as a result, Mary is falsely given credit for bringing about the 12 day return of magic. And Douglas, wrap it up. Finally, somehow we get to the end of this book, uh, where an uneasy detente forms around the new magical entity between those who still embrace magic and those who uh, have pursued a scientific path. Um, and the key event there is that the technology that came from the unearthly vehicle is shared among the powers that be amongst both factions. All right, and that's where we are now. We're gonna try and revisit this maybe next week, but you know, adults trying to schedule things being what it is, don't hold that to us. Uh, but let's <laughs> not forget the reason we're here. We are here to promote, and the URL's down at the bottom, it'll be in the doobly-doo, the exclusive dark fantasy and sci-fi bundle available at storybundle.com slash exclusive. Well, thank you guys. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, thank you. This is, this is a lot of fun. I'm glad I uh, took part. Right. Yeah. No, it's, uh, likewise, this is fun. Uh, Tona, uh, just a timing question. Um, the bundle only runs to September 9th. Okay. So I am actually going to make a few edits to this and upload it right immediately. Okay, super. Thanks so much for doing this. Sure. Uh, all right. Uh, final statement. This is this video. The content we created for this is realty under Creative Commons, attribution, share alike, commercial. So you can do whatever you want with it. You can make money. Just remember to attribute it to the three of us. All right. And that's it. See you guys next time.